Okay, before uh, we begin the presentation, uh, my name is Wayne Koblenz. I'm the Acting Center Director for the Dairy Forage Research Center, and we are very happy that you're all here for the presentation this morning at the Dairy Forage Seminar Series. I have two announcements that I'm obligated to make here. Number one, this presentation is being recorded, so if you have a cell phone, please make sure the ringer is down or you've turned it off. Thank you. The other thing is you see a few promotional materials around. I'm obligated to say that as an employee of the federal government, <clears throat> none of that constitutes a, uh, an endorsement by the United States Department of Agriculture. So I need to make that clear. Okay, uh, we're very pleased this morning to have Dr. Kim Cassida with us from Michigan State University. She's an extension forage specialist there. And uh, as a matter of full disclosure, we have worked together a few times in the past, dating back further than either of us would like to admit. So <clears throat> Kim is very entertaining, and she's going to speak to us today on evaluating reduced lignin alfalfa yield and quality across the United States. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Kim. Thank you, and thank you, everybody, for coming. Is this loud enough? Can you all hear out there? All right. I was, uh, I was asked to come up with a topic about alfalfa, so I decided on this one. Uh, I have been involved with some of the, the work to evaluate reduced lignin alfalfa um, in its early phases, but I didn't approach this talk as just being uh, a summary of what I have done. I actually went through the literature and the farm reports and dug up all the information I could find about how these uh, reduced lignin materials have performed since they were released. So the big critical question, oh, and I'm also going to say, similar to Wayne, I don't work for the federal government. I work for the state. But I, the same thing applies. We talk about these products, but that doesn't necessarily mean we're endorsing them. Our role as university uh, researchers is to be the objective people who evaluate things without bias. So I'm trying to present the information to you in a way that's just giving you the facts and you can make your own decisions. But the challenge of what we uh, are trying to deal with with dairy forage, alfalfa in particular, is this classic trade-off of yield versus quality. And I'm sure you're all aware of that if you grow alfalfa. We know that as yield increases with days of regrowth of the stand, then we um, reach a peak where if you leave it out there long enough, you'll actually start to decrease a little bit. But at the same time as that is happening, our quality is going down. So if you evaluate quality with RFQ as an indicator of the overall quality of the material, as yield goes up, quality goes down. That's inescapable. Um, and it causes us a problem because we would like to optimize both of them. The components of quality that are changing are uh, just shown here. Typically, we will see that the NDF digestibility, this purple line, will be decreasing as we advance in maturity. Crude protein will also decrease a little bit, um, or a lot, depending on how far you go. NDF, on the other hand, will be increasing. And the main driver that is, um, that's pushing the NDF and the digestibility decrease, point the right thing there, is this lignin in the red line. So lignin is not a very large percentage of the plant, but it has a very large impact on digestibility of the material, which I'll talk about in a minute. But first, I want to point this out. Um, the third piece of this trade-off that we have to consider is persistence of the plant. So what happens when we try and optimize quality for our dairy cows? We're typically going to be harvesting alfalfa at the late bud stage. And this old chart indicates that as you're looking at yield here, here's our late bud stage is approximately where the arrow is pointing. If you look at this line down here, this is how the roots are recharging their carbohydrate stores after cutting. So if you wait until one-tenth bloom, typically it's fully restored. That was the basis for the old recommendation of waiting to one-tenth bloom. 
but if you cut at late bud, you never let it get there. And so your next cutting is going to start at an already depleted level. And as you can probably imagine, if you repeat this cycle enough times, eventually the plant is out of root carbohydrates. And this is what causes that early decline of our stands sometimes when we're on an intensive cutting schedule. All right, getting back to lignin and how that relates. Uh, what lignin is, it's a phenolic compound. It is considered a secondary compound in plant cell walls. This is what it looks like. Uh, we have our fibers of cellulose, which is the, the big groups of fibers here. And the hemicellulose is the green fibers that are kind of meshed around there. And all around those, we have these brown fibers, which is the lignin. And the lignin, basically, as time goes on, it fills in all the gaps between the cellulose and the hemicellulose. All right? So it's uh, kind of solidifying that whole mass. And that is going to increase steadily as the plant matures. Alfalfa, in general, is going to contain somewhere between 5 to 14 percent lignin, depending on what stage of the cycle you cut it at. Lower lignin, when it's very, very immature, if you wait until it's fully mature and senescing, maybe up to 14. Most of that is in the stem material. Why do we care? Um, the big reason that we care about how much lignin is in there is because it is indigestible to virtually, not only ruminants, but virtually everything that we know of. There are a few bacteria that seem to be able to break it down a little bit in the soil, but it is very slow to degrade. Um, and the problem with that is because it is completely surrounding or increasingly surrounding the digestible part of the cell wall, which is the cellulose and the hemicellulose, um, it blocks access of the rumen microbes to be able to get to that and digest it. It's just a physical barrier. When that happens, we reduce the, uh, the fiber digestibility in the rumen. When we reduce the fiber digestibility in the rumen, we consequently reduce feed intake because it takes longer for the fiber to move out of the rumen, the animal can eat less. All these things affect your bottom line and your performance. So why don't we just get rid of it completely? Um, well, we can't do that because it is actually required by the plant. It provides the structural support that holds the plant up uh, to a large extent. Uh, lignin also plays a critical role in water movement in the plant. Uh, it's involved in making the xylem vessels waterproof. Those are the, the uh, conduits that move water around in the plant. It also acts as a defense against pests and pathogens. It can act like a physical barrier that prevents those from getting into our plant. Uh, and it's been pretty consistently shown in, in alfalfa as well as other crops that if you take out too much lignin, you're going to get a reduction in yield. Um, there is something about this that actually is negatively correlated with uh, biomass production in the plant, probably because of all these beneficial um, reasons that are, we have. So that I, I got asked recently, it's like, why do we have to call it reduced lignin instead of low lignin? And the main reason behind that very minor blip in terminology is that it's really not low. The amount that we have taken out is a very small amount of the total that was in there. All right, so you really can't call it low lignin if you only reduced it by 5%. Um, we can call it reduced lignin. And that is enough to make a difference um, in how it's going to perform in, in your cow diet. So that's how the story behind that. So can you reduce lignin by conventional breeding? Uh, the answer there completely is yes. And um, we've been doing that for a long time. We have varieties that are called high quality varieties. Um, sometimes high quality, sometimes Q, sometimes HD for high digestibility. We've had these around for 20 years where people have been working on trying to improve the digestibility just by a conventional breeding system. Uh, but it's slow. It's a very slow process to do it that way. Um, and I already talked about that. This is just a slide I put together uh, last year. This is based on our forage variety test in Michigan, just one year test. I said, 
you know, I wonder how much variability we do have in fiber digestibility. So I just took my first cut samples from our test uh, that was planted in 2016. So these samples were collected in the 2018 growing season and compared yield down here to uh, NDF digestibility. And so what we have here, the line in the middle of the dry matter yield uh, axis is the mean. So that was the average dry matter yield in that cutting. And here's the average NDF digestibility. So what we would like to have in a desirable forage variety would be high yield and high digestibility, right? So we actually did have a fair amount of variability here. Um, we had a good amount of our varieties that actually fell into this upper quadrant. And I will also say that to the best of my knowledge, because some of these are experimental, so I'm not sure what they are, but to the best of my knowledge, there are no Harv Extra varieties in this particular test. We did have quite a few that were designated as HQ and all those types that we've had around for a while. <coughs> But it does indicate that it's possible to have the best of both worlds um, to some extent. But people thought maybe we can do this faster. So some years ago, probably 10 or 15 years when this started, uh, the Consortium for Alfalfa Improvement was put together and they were trying to use genetic engineering to speed up this process. Uh, and this group uh, consisted of uh, Forage Genetics International, or I think maybe it was actually Monsanto at that time, um, the Samuel Roberts Noble Foundation and the uh, Dairy Forage Research Center was all working together to try and apply genetic modification to a specific lignin gene. And without getting into great detail about the chemistry here, uh, what they did, this is the process by which lignins, and there are more than one type of lignin, this is the chemical process by which they are synthesized. So in this process of genetic engineering, they were not adding something to the plant. They were causing the plant to turn off a gene that it already had, which is the one that drives this part of the reaction right here. And when you block that reaction from happening, you don't get all of this stuff down here. And that is how they addressed reducing the uh, amount of lignin that's in there. So what happens when you do that, back to this chart that we've already seen, here's our yield, here's our RFQ for our normal alfalfa, and here's the predicted RFQ for a reduced lignin alfalfa. We still have lignin, all right? The lignin still increases with the uh, maturity of the plant, but it is delayed. It happens more slowly. So you can push your push your reduction in quality out a little bit. So if this is the spot where we would have the optimum compromise of yield and quality for normal alfalfa, right here, if you want to get to that same RFQ point on the reduced lignin, you're moved out to here, all right? You've now got more yield, same quality, more yield, because there was more time. And here's your new optimum date for harvesting it up to, um, well, in this particular example, we're about a week later, all right? That does often enable the plant to get to one-tenth bloom from late bud. So we could theoretically be helping with those root reserves. So here's our overall hope of what we're going to get is equal annual yield and quality in fewer harvests with better persistence. And I'm going to show some data from a variety of different places that addresses whether that is actually happening. <clears throat> what does the data say? Um, this was probably the first uh, replicated trial that was published. This was done in Minnesota. Uh, and they uh, looked at different reference normal alfalfa varieties versus a Harv Extra variety 54 HVX 41 and they compared it at different cutting schedules. So they were cutting it either at 30 days, 35 day or 40 day intervals. And they averaged all their standard uh, reference alfalfas together. So here's our Harv Extra and the dotted line and here's the normal ones with the solid line. This is forage, forage yield, I can't read sideways. Okay, so yield is increasing over time. The Harv Extra did not increase quite as fast um, and it didn't reach the same peak yield here. 
But when you look at alfalfa relative forage quality, you don't really want to look at them at exactly the same point in time, right, if you're going to delay the harvest. So if you look at this on a 30-day harvest, they actually were the same at that point. Then look at it at 35 day. So here is our dotted line. If you track that all the way back over here, it's actually got more yield than the conventional varieties had at 30 days. All right. Same quality, because you look over here, here's that equivalent line, and they match up pretty well. All right. So we're saying this is actually doing what we expected it to do. This is good. All right. Here's just another way to look at their data. Maybe. Um, Looking at lignin, they did have a reduction in lignin with their Harvextra. They had better NDF digestibility, a little less NDF, and uh, not much change in crude protein in this case. And um, actually, I don't believe they had a significant difference in the yield when they looked at it overall. So the yields were pretty close together overall. Oops, we're just going to ignore those. All right. Now that moves on into the next uh, study that was published, and this is the one that I was involved in. Um, this is often referred to as the six state study um, because there were six states involved in it. This was funded by uh, Forge Genetics um, for full disclosure, but the researchers did have a lot of input into what exactly we were doing to try and make sure that we were getting good objective data. Um, the Six states that were involved were Ohio, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, California, and Kansas because we we're trying to get a range of environments across the entire country. The purpose of this study was to get some general information. So on average, how does this material perform across a range of different environments? It really wasn't about looking at within each one of these states, how is each cutting different from each other cutting? We're looking at the big picture here. So this was um, planted in 2015, and we did one production year of data in 2016. This was using a, an experimental variety that was never released, uh, because that was all that was available at that time when we started it. <clears throat> Our objective was to compare the forage yield and nutritive value of the Harv Extra with a high yield standard variety and a high quality standard variety across different harvest intervals in as many environments as was financially feasible. All right, what did we find out? Uh, this chart right here shows, and I'm sorry that it is in um, metric units. This is from our scientific publication, but you can see the trends. This is yield. A Harv Extra is the black line. Our high yield standard variety is the blue line, and our high quality standard variety is the red line. So yield actually did not differ if you looked at it at the same point in time. This uh, bar right here indicates how big the difference had to be for it to be statistically significantly different. And within each one of these cutting schedules, it, it overlaps. So this is 28 days, 33 days, and 38 days. All right, but the key thing to look at here is, again, how do they compare the Harv Extra at a long harvest interval to Harv Extra or I'm sorry, to the standard varieties at a short interval. And that's what this dotted line here is showing. Here's our intensive 28-day schedule. Here's Harv Extra at 38-day schedule. No difference among them at 28 days, but if you waited to do this one at 38, you're now going to have quite a bit more yield than you would have had um, harvesting a conventional one at 28. And if these other sections look at the quality, here's crude protein, same structure of the charts. Here's NDF digestibility, and here's NDF. So if you look down here at the cell wall, because that's the most important thing that we think about with a reduced lignin variety, um, yes, NDF goes up with maturity in all three of them, and digestibility goes down. But again, if we found that the, uh, the Harv Extra at any single date was always better all right, than the other two. But if you look at them across those cuttings, again, Harv Extra over here has the same, qual or same digestibility as our high quality standard over here. 
but with more yield. All right, you follow that? That's our key piece. This is a fancy chart just to show, uh, our statistician got crazy with this one, but it's kind of cool, so I'm gonna try and explain it to you. Uh, what we have here is again, the blue is our high, qual or high yield standard, the red is our high quality standard, and here's our Harv Extra over here. And this is a method of looking at overall how does this, do these varieties um, segregate for all of these different quality traits. So we have lignin, ash, fiber digestibility. This is undegradable fiber at 48 hours. NDF, yield, mean stage count is a measure of the stage maturity of the plant, and crude protein. So what this is showing us, for anything that's moving in this direction, as harvest interval decrease, increases from 28, 33 to 38, we are increasing lignin, we are increasing undegradable NDF, that's bad. Um, we are increasing NDF, increasing yield, that's good. Um, and we are increasing the maturity score, which is just telling us that yes, it is maturing as we would expect. Um, we are decreasing ash, digestibility of the fiber, and crude protein. Crude protein we don't necessarily want to uh, decrease, but it's generally considered to be a good thing to be reducing ash and and um, reducing ash, but we don't really want to decrease NDF de de degradability either. So what we're doing over here is we are decreasing crude protein and increasing yield. But the key thing here is that our Harv Extra one is not in the same part of this chart as this. So that means that it is changing at a different rate. Anyway, sort of cool. Um, another thing that we found while doing this study, and this actually seemed to be, uh, for some peculiar reason, was more commonly happening at my site than the other five, uh, but it's a bit of a caution that we had not really thought about, uh, but we found that as we were extending our harvest interval, all right, we were actually sometimes running into trouble with our stewardship requirement. So when you buy a, a bag of Harv Extra, which is also Roundup Ready GMO alfalfa seed, uh, you are agreeing, um, depending on what part of the country you live in, that you will always cut it before one-tenth bloom, if you're in the major Midwest part, and if you're in the seed-producing areas, um, sorry, you should cut it in the Midwest before 50% bloom, and in the seed-producing areas before one-tenth bloom. Get that straight. Um, we sometimes, when we extended the harvest interval, we were running into that threshold. So that would mean that at that point, you would need to cut it, regardless of whether that was where you planned to do it or not. Not always. Mostly when it was growing under stressful conditions. The Michigan site, we carried this on for two extra years. Um, the, the other sites were terminated after 2016 for reasons I'll explain in a second. Um, but in Michigan, we had the opportunity to keep it going, primarily because we were interested. We'd already done this work with the harvest schedules. We were interested in seeing, um, did we actually reduce persistence of the alfalfa if we kept hammering it for three production years? So we did. Um, and what we found, here we have uh, the 28-day schedule in light blue, 33 days medium blue, and 38 days in dark blue in our four production years, the seeding year. Um, in 2017, we had a fairly significant drought at our research site, uh, but the plants were able to recover from that and bounce back a little in 2018. But what we consistently found was that the 33 and 38 day production cycle um, yielded more than the 28 day. Okay? This has not, got nothing to do with the variety. This is across all of the varieties. This is just talking about cutting schedule. Okay? <coughs> so, in spring of 2019, we went out and dug plants because we wanted to see what kind of survival we actually had after doing this. Um, it, this is what the stands looked like. So visibly, it looked like we were getting some decline. We had some heaved plants and there were some dead areas. Um, you know, overall, it, it looked like a stand that was not completely happy. We did have a hard winter in Michigan last year. Um, but what we found when we did the statistics on this, we actually did not find a statistically significant difference in stand density amongst any of our treatments. 
So it was not affected by harvest schedule. It was not affected by variety. All right. Our average uh, plant density was eight and a half crowns per square foot, which is still well within the productive range of an alfalfa stand. So uh, I guess my bottom line, we were surprised by this. We thought we were going to see a difference. Um, but the key is we are taking care of the stand in every other way. Good fertility. Um, these pot the way a research plot is run, it doesn't get a lot of traffic on it, which is a big difference from the way you, you guys would have it. Um, so I guess it just shows that it is possible to keep them going with a 28-day schedule. All right. In Ohio, they did a little bit of extra work with their site um, on the peak system. So one of the questions has been, when you actually change the amount of, of uh, fiber that's in that plant, is it going to change the calibrations for the peak stick? All right, if you use those. Um, so they did a little test of that with the data from Ohio and Wisconsin on this trial. And what they found was looking at this one Harvextra variety, which is the only one we had in here, it didn't appear that the e equations needed to be adjusted. But <coughs> we're putting that information out with a caveat that we think that we do need to continue to look at this with all of the new different Harvextra varieties that are coming out and make sure that it applies across the board. But at least as preliminary results, it doesn't seem like you need to change your peak sticks. You can just use the same ones you still have. All right. Then we have um, what we are calling six-state study take two. So I said I was going to explain why the first study was terminated. Um, that was because we were using that experimental variety that was not going to be commercially released. And so since Forge Genetics was paying for this, they preferred to start over with some varieties that were going to be commercially released that would be more typical of what you guys would actually be using. So we basically took it out. We put in a very similar trial um, using a high yield conventional, a high quality conventional, and two experimental Harv extras that were on the brink of release. Very similar design, except for that in this case, we only had two harvest schedules. We thought maybe we didn't need to do the third one. We're just sticking with um, a seven-day interval of 28 and 35 days. All right, so we had two objectives. Oh, this is six states, but it's not the same six states. Uh, Pennsylvania dropped out, and we added Utah uh, for various you know, reasons that had nothing to do with the trial, just what people wanted to do. Um, so we're looking here, very similar to the first trial, looking at yield and quality, but we also added in an objective to look at fungicides, all right? Because one of the thoughts that occurred to us is if you leave your alfalfa out in the field for a longer period of time before you cut it, there is the possibility that that might give you greater opportunity to have fungal leaf diseases affect it because it's out there longer. So we, at three of the sites, Michigan, Ohio, and Wisconsin, we also added a fungicide treatment. And we didn't do it at the other three sites because they're in a much drier climate. They don't typically have problems with leaf diseases, or so they told us. All right. Now, this particular study, all I have to talk about is dry matter uh, data because we are still working on making sure the forage quality calibrations are correct. Uh, but I can give you a sneak peek of dry matter. When you looked at it averaged across all six states, we actually found no difference in dry matter yield, total annual dry matter yield in the first production year across these four varieties, which is good, okay? There is no yield drag. That's something a lot of people have been worried about, okay? And again, this is not looking at all possible alfalfa varieties you could be. Um, could be growing, but this is a pretty good indicator that the Harv extra types are not um, going to be seeing a significant disadvantage compared to other varieties. Um, when we looked at harvest interval, we did see that we had an improvement in total annual yield for the 35-day interval versus the 28-day interval, about 4.3% improvement in yield when we were able to delay a week. <coughs> The other thing I want to show you um, in regards to this study is some of the fungicide data because it was actually kind of, uh, when we did our first cutting of this the first year, the sites that had applied fungicide were all calling each other on the phone and going, 
did you see that? <laughs> because you could visibly see the difference with the fungicide um, in the plots. So here is one. This is first cutting. Here's one that was received the fungicide treatment, and this one did not. And I think even in this maybe not great light, you can see that there's a lot of dead leaves on the bottom of these plants, and there's not very many over here. All right. Um, when we looked at how that affected our dry matter yield, we did find a significant difference. This is averaged across all three sites for just that first production year. Um, our second production year is actually not complete yet. We haven't done the last cutting yet, so I can't show you a summary of that data. Um, but for this first year, the, her, the fungicide was only applied three times. It was applied after, uh, before first, second, and third cutting because that's as many times as you're allowed, according to the label on Priaxor, to apply it. But we actually found an overall annual improvement in yield between the control and the Priaxor treatment of 0.3 tons per acre improvement with fungicide, which is about 7.7%. And interestingly, we didn't apply any fungicide in the fourth cutting, and we still had a significant improvement in yield. We didn't have it a significant improvement in the fifth cutting, which was pretty late. Um, and there was no difference here for dry matter yield. It didn't matter which harvest interval. So there didn't seem to be an extra benefit to go on 28 versus 35 days. And there was no difference between the varieties in their response to the fungicide on yield. What we don't know yet, because we don't have this data complete, is how this might affect quality, right? Because those dead leaves aren't going to have the same quality as a live leaf. So when we get that data out, um, I'll be very interested to see what that does. Um, but <clears throat> the point of having this be um, no difference between varieties is of interest, because one of the things that has been a concern is Remember I told you that lignin is involved in disease resistance in the plant. So one of the concerns was if you take that out, do you actually increase disease problems in those plants inherently? Um, and Dr. Debbie Samak actually did a study looking at that and uh, looked at in differences in disease incidence for these three leaf spot diseases and did not find any differences. All right, the Harvextra alfalfa, perform the same as a standard variety. Um, so that's good in that it doesn't appear that we have an inherent difference due to the trait. However, she did find that when they delayed harvest and left the material in the field longer, they did see an increase in diseases all right, across all varieties, which would suggest that our fungicide idea might be onto something. So stay tuned on that. All right, lastly, I want to talk actually next to lastly, about animal performance. And this is not going to take very long because unfortunately there is not a lot of data on animal performance. Um, this is kind of a surprise to me for as long as this material has been out there, but it is expensive to do animal research and it takes a long time to get it done. And I know that a lot of people are doing trials, they just haven't put the results out yet. So stay tuned on that. But what we do have um, is some of the initial work that was done during development of the trait by Dave Mertens um, that is showing that the Harvextra trait did improve in vivo digestibility of fiber and dry matter in lambs. They did it with lambs because they didn't have very much material. They didn't have enough material to feed cows, so they had to do it with a smaller animal. They also found that when they increased the digestibility of the material, they increased the dry matter intake in the animals. That's what we would expect. Better digestibility, they can eat more. There are some non-replicated farm trials that if you've been to any of, of Forage Genetics presentations, uh, they will tell you about those that do indicate that um, in, at least in a non-replicated situation that there is a suggestion that we have some improvements in milk production. All right, but none of that is replicated or done by an objective third party. Um, and lastly, we have um, a study that was done in Montana by Peterson et al., uh, published in 2018, and it was done with beef cattle, with growing beef cattle. This is a replicated study that was funded by Forge Genetics, um, and they fed 
Harv extra and a reference alfalfa hay to these growing calves and measured animal performance. Unfortunately, for unknown reasons, they were not actually able to detect a difference in forage quality amongst the alfalfas in this trial. And part of that was due to the growing conditions that they had uh, were a bit unusual. But as you might expect, when there's no difference in forage quality amongst the alfalfas, there was also no difference in animal performance. All right. So that's where we're at <laughs> with our knowledge base on the animals. So the last, truly the last thing I want to talk about is how you would use all this information to, in your management system. So most of us working in extension, we see two options for how you can approach using uh, reduced lignin alfalfa. One is you can manage it for the improved quality and take advantage of that. Um, so in this case, you would probably just continue to manage alfalfa on the cutting schedule you've always used. You're going to use an intensive schedule. You, um, on that same date and time, your yield should be similar based on our data. Uh, but your quality will be better, okay, most of the time. Um, it will, you can, you can take advantage of this additional flexibility in case you have a weather delay. So that does help you out there. You don't lose as much quality if you don't get it quite when you uh, hope to get it. Um, one of the downsides of this is this is a take home from what we know about using brown midrib corn. One of the things that was found pretty consistently with that was because the digestibility is better, animals eat more. So in order to take advantage of the full advantage of that trait, you have to have more corn silage so they can eat more. Okay. Now, we don't have enough animal data yet to know for sure if that's going to work with, um, with this trait, but it does suggest the lamb data does suggest it will. Um, so it's possible you might need to have a greater alfalfa acreage in order to take full advantage of the trait. Um, and lastly, it's like I, I say this to everybody who talks to me about this, um, you got to work with your nutritionist to make sure your ration is balanced because alfalfa is different <laughs> than it used to be when you're using this material. Um, and you may need to make other adjustments in the ration to make sure that the animals have enough effective fiber, protein is balanced, and that everything else um, is the, where it ought to be. Your second strategy is to manage it for greater yield and possibly reduced harvest cost. So in this case, you're going to have the same quality, all right, but you're going to use that delayed harvest schedule and take advantage of greater yield at the same quality. So the research data indicates that most of the time you can expect that you can go up to a week later um, without having um, major problems. And this might enable you to reduce your harvest cost by taking one less cutting. This is how this looks. This is a, a typical harvest schedule in Michigan where we're going to start cutting alfalfa probably in late May. On a typical 28-day schedule is this red bar. Here's every 28 days. We can fit in five cuttings. The green one shows if we delayed that by <coughs> five days, all right, each cutting is five days longer, to get out to about the same point in the fall, we now only have time to fit in four cuttings, all right? But that's OK, because we're still getting actually a little bit better yield with that and the same quality. And we have less traffic over the field. We let our, we let our alfalfa get out um, farther out into its recovery cycle so that our roots are theoretically in better shape. Um, and it's just you know fewer trips over the field that cost you money in fuel and things like that. Uh, and here's a 38-day schedule, again, pushing it out even a little bit more. One of the things that may happen with this is, depending on what part of the country you're in and where your no-cut window is in the fall, remember, we don't like you to cut for six weeks before a killing frost, all right? And in Michigan, the 23rd of September actually is in that window. So if we were using this schedule, probably what we would just do is wait until after the killing frost to take that last cutting. <clears throat> but you just need to be aware of that because it changes your timing. 
you do need to, uh, if you're using the extended harvest schedule, you do need to watch out for that flowering threshold and make sure you're following your stewardship agreement. Um, you may possibly see a benefit from using fungicides. Again, we need to get the rest of the data on that, uh, but it seems likely that that may pan out. But that's an additional cost that you have to think about. Um, and possibly this might get you a longer stand life. And that is all I have. So I'm told now there will be a lot of questions. <laughs> Maybe I was so thorough there'll be no questions. <laughs> Does anybody here already use this material? Do you like it? What do you like about it? It keeps quality, okay. Good, I like to hear that. Um. More flexibility, that's what you like? Yeah. 42 days, okay. All right, where are you located? Southwest Nebraska, you've had it go over 200 RFQ at 42 days, okay. That's pretty impressive. <laughs> yeah. Uh, when we pencil, you know, how much you pay for the fungicide is going to um, depend on who you're getting your fungicide from. And the last time I tried to actually put a dollar value on that, the uh, fungicide people told me my numbers were all wrong, so. <laughs> So they said you should get a deal from them. They said my prices were too high. But we were able actually to show that it still made money, even using a very high price for it. And I'll also point out that in that particular study, we were applying it at the maximum rate, uh, and that may not be necessary. Um, that work hasn't been done either to indicate uh, most of the people selling Priaxor tell me you don't typically have to use it at anywhere near the uh, maximum rate. But that is an area of research that probably needs to be looked at. I know I can say, at least in Michigan, I have done uh, some fungicide work with uh, Priaxor's predecessor, Headline. And that was all contract work with, with the chemical companies, but they never once asked us to put it on first cutting. They always wanted us to put it on the midsummer cuttings. And the, actually, the, at least in our site, the biggest bump we saw was first cutting. And so there's an open avenue for an opportunity to investigate that, <clears throat> especially with the weather that we've been having in the spring. I mean, this was like perfect weather for fungus the year that we did this because the spring was really, really wet. Um, we were delayed getting out there. We did have some lodging. I should probably mention that. People always ask about lodging with Harv Extra. Um, and in our experience with these multi-state trials, we do, we do take lodging scores. Um, and yes, it will lodge, but usually when it lodges, everything else is lodging too. So it's not any different than our other varieties, at least as far as we can tell. So alfalfa will lodge. You know, if, you're, if it gets, especially first cutting, it gets really tall, and you're, maybe you're late getting out there and you have a hard rain, it's going to go down. So, but that's a perfect opportunity for your fungus to get in there when that happens. We did, yes, yeah. We, we had an application charge and the price of the chemical. So it was, it was able to pay off, yeah. <clears throat> but, you know, it's like anything else. You start doing economics, it's like, well, exactly how much did you have to pay for that? You can play with your numbers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah, well, I think part of it is you can get peak sticks that are, have different scales. Like in Michigan, typically we use peak sticks that are, have an NDF scale. 
but I know you can also get them that are an RFQ scale. This, this work was done looking at the uh, NDF scale. So maybe it might be different for RFQ. Yeah. Right. So um, there's a lot of different things that get put on the, on the uh, peak sticks. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> I would agree. But I think that that is something that we need to uh, continue to look at that because I was surprised by that too. It, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense that well, the same equations would work. Yeah. Really yeah. 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 And you don't see it. You do see a difference in NDF, but it's not a huge difference. Not as big as a difference in other things. <coughs> Anything else? Yes, John. Yeah. So the question is, did we did we look at the data also more on the basis of individual differences within states based on weather patterns and such. Um, and that is actually something the group is looking at right now of whether to take a second look at that data and try and pull that piece out. Um, and we'd probably also be looking at that with the second trial. Because obviously there are different, you know, there's some pretty distinct differences in environments amongst the states that we're in. Um, and I know I can also say just looking in one environment that every cutting won't be exactly the same. So what this data is telling us, this is the overall big picture average. It doesn't mean that every single cutting of Harv Extra everywhere that anyone ever does is going to have exactly these differences, okay? There will be times, like was shown in the beef cattle study, you know, that there was no difference. Um, but in general, most of the time, we do expect there to be a difference. Um, the question is about did we look at soil fertility across the states? We just have background fertility. Um, they were all managed for maximum recommendations for alfalfa. So, you know, we're, all of these were put on good sites. So they're probably, it's not something we specifically looked at, but I wouldn't expect it to have been a huge player with the way we were managing them. <coughs> but that's a good question that might be something that would be worth looking at, because not all alfalfa is grown on optimal sites. 